All right, welcome back and thanks for tuning in again. So we're going to take a break today from the uh, Holly EFI conversion on this Slant 6 Chrysler gen set. Uh, instead, I'm going to work on this uh, Detroit Diesel GM Diesel 471. I've had this engine for a little over a year now and haven't done anything with it. Um, I bought it pretty reasonably off of Facebook Marketplace, just kind of on a whim. Uh, it does turn. I don't know the history of it. I imagine it hasn't been run in probably about 10 years. It's a pretty early uh, block, as from what I can tell. We'll get into that in a little bit. So uh, the, the plan today is just to get it running, see how it runs. Uh, we'll pull the uh, injector nozzles out. We'll drop the oil pan. And um, yeah, just a little assessment of it and have a little bit of fun. Let's get started. Well, here's a quick walk around of this thing. This is what it looked like before we cleaned it off. It's pretty well packed with uh, grease and dirt and everything. I mean, it's been sitting outside for a lot of years. Luckily, the exhaust has been covered up. I do believe it turns. It may be a little bit tight. We'll have to throw some oil or something down the cylinders. All right, let me give this thing a bath. So I'm midway through power washing this thing, and this guy crawls out of somewhere. Look at the size of him. What on earth kind of spider is that? Whew. He's going to have to get relocated. <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah, he doesn't like simple green. He's all slippery. All right, let's get you moved out of there. He's coming after me. Let's take a little walk around this thing. This is post power washing. I know it may not look like it. The, uh, the grease and grime is pretty well packed on there. So let's get a shot of the data tag. Zoom in on that. So I spoke with a, uh, a, a gentleman that I consider to be the Detroit historian, more or less, uh, here on the East Coast. He's actually up on Long Island. And he's got a uh, production list of these uh, Detroit engines, GM engines going all the way back to uh, 1938 when the first 71 series was sold. So it looks like this block was sold sometime September, late September of 1940. So that makes this block pretty early. First 71 series was sold in 1938, is what he told me. I think I already said that. Interesting that it has a bypass oil filter, but not full flow. So the filter housing only has these two little copper lines feeding it there. So it's only doing bypass service. Also interesting to me is this housing here is bronze or brass. It's cast brass or cast bronze. Non-ferrous metal for sure. It's kind of a yellowy color. I took a file to it right there. You can kind of see it there. Interesting. I wonder why that was. It seems like an odd choice of materials. It's a low block engine. We've got an actual head gasket in there. I think the head's been off recently. It's got a blob of silicone coming off, coming out of it there. Now when I say recently, that could be, you know, in the last uh, decade or three, you know, compared to this engine's long history. The radiator shroud is obviously not original to the block. See, it says Detroit Diesel there. This is more of a 1970s era radiator shroud. Same thing with the, uh, the intake housing here to the blower. I don't think this symbol here, this logo, came out to the 70s. You know, it's also got this other tag on it that I'm not sure what this signifies. That tag is copper, so I don't think it's original. 
I don't know, maybe that indicates uh, some machine work that was done to the block sometime in the past, I don't know. I mean, when an engine, especially a Detroit, gets this old, you never know how many times it's been worked on or overhauled. You know, these engines were so universal and they, they changed so little over the decades. You know, I did notice we have a uh, repair here on the oil cooler housing. Looks like a braze here. See that? Must have cracked at some point. Probably froze. Alright, well let's uh let's pull the rocker cover off. See what's underneath of there. Oh yeah, it's got these cast aluminum little daisy wheels too. They're not the stamp steel ones. I don't know if that means anything. Like I said, I'm not a Detroit expert. Now I pulled this cover off when I first brought this engine home just to see uh, if there was any water damage in there, so it should pop right off. Looks pretty clean under there. Pretty clean actually, right? A little bit of water sitting in there. Not much, not much of anything. So the head, the head might be newer, because from what I understand, the uh, the early heads had the fuel rails running externally along this side, and uh, these are all internal. It's a two-valve head, though. Let's take a get a get a closer look. Looks like it's got the early style. Uh, injector plungers, not the plungers, but the, I don't know what you call that part on the tip of the valve there. Not the tappet, but elephant's foot, I think that's what my buddy called it. Let's see what size injectors are in there, can't quite see. Can't see the tags. Looks like the racks are free. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we'll still pull those nozzles out. Check the tips before we run it. Let's see. The throttle lock doesn't seem to work. Yeah, they're all free. We'll, uh, take them out and put them on the bench and lubricate them a little bit. Make sure we don't get one stuck. I'm curious to take the pan off and see if there's a lot of sludge build up in there, but boy the head sure looks clean, doesn't it? Never mind, they're HV7 injectors. Alright, so we got the air filter out of the way jumper lines have been removed and uh, we're gonna pop these rocker assemblies off so we can access the injector nozzles or injector assemblies
Alrighty. All four injector assemblies are out. Not much to see down there except for some grime and dirt. Let's see. Yeah, definitely some watery gunk sliding down there. Let me get that cleaned out. Let's look at these nozzles here. The tips certainly have a lot of carbon on them. Boy, there it is. You couldn't see it for all that carbon. Oh, wow. Look at that one. Oops, sorry. Looks like it probably wasn't under much of a load, whatever it was doing. It was just kind of sitting there loafing along. Boy, they all feel nice and free. Probably didn't even need to take them out. I did notice one of them looks a little bit different than the others. Is it this one? The, uh, the tappet there, or the head, looks wider on, I think, this one. Yeah, number two, number three, is it? Yeah. Alright, let me get the uh, stuff suck, soaked up out of those uh, injector tubes. Well, I threw some uh, WD-40 and kerosene down the cylinders. We'll let that soak for a little bit, but I want to pull this oil filter cover off of the housing and uh, pull the air box covers and take a peek in there. I loosen this drain plug here. Probably nothing in there. Just some uh, just some sludgy stuff. Also, I want to check and make sure I got the right replacement oil filter. Nope, I didn't. <laughs> All right, well, guess I'm gonna have to go pick that up at some point today. Get that out of there. What is this one? That's a 1503 Napa. Yep. What did I get? I got a 5133. See the difference there? That big hole. This one has the small hole in the seal on each end. Ah, oh, geez. All right, let's pull those airbox covers off. Then I got to make a couple phone calls. Let's see if I can come up with that filter today. Uh, finally, the sun's starting to come out. It's cold out this morning. It's only like 24 degrees. I got that ceiling washer on there.
Oh wow, that's pretty uh pretty oily in there. And there's a spider web, that's cool. I wonder if that's where that wolf spider we saw is uh, living. Living in the air box. Look at that, save the gaskets and everything. Let's take a look. There's a piston and a ring. I don't know, do those wolf spiders make a web like this? I don't think so. Well, maybe they do, I have no idea. <laughs> I guess they do, right? Not much to see in there right now. Got a nice layer of uh, wheelie sludge, that's okay. It's about normal for these engines, I guess. I don't see any liquid oil sitting in there, no puddles. No, no puddle. I'm sure it could use a set of blower drive seals. Well, we're starting to get some snow flurries here. So I want to yank this oil pan out and uh, at least I can cover the engine up and then clean it. I don't know if the snow's going to get any worse or not. Anyway, I got about all, I think I got all the pan bolts out. I'm gonna take this one out over here. Come on. Got one in here holding it. Tighter than I thought. Jeez, I can't pull it out with my fingers. Hang on. It's always one. There it goes. Alrighty. Oh, that's interesting. The pickup screen is uh, not on the pickup. Hmm. Glad we took that off. Yeah, I had a little bit of water sitting in it. Yeah, not too bad in the sludge department. You got a big dent in it there. Big dent. Huh. I wonder how that came off. I imagine it's supposed to hook in there nice and securely. Looks like it's got all its cotter pins in the uh, bolts. That's a plus. Really clean in there overall. 
this engine has must have been gone through not too long ago. Looks like it at least at least it'll be an easy gasket to make. The old one was cork. I'll have to make it out of regular paper. Alright, well I'd like to pull a uh, rod cap and a main cap. Have a little peek at the bearings. Let's pop pop this main cap off down here. I got number four or no, number four rod cap loose and uh, the rear main cap. Kind of a difficult angle to film at. They say two cycle Detroits only wear half, one half of the bearings. They wear the bottom half the most of the mains, which is understandable. Most any engine will do that. And they only really wear the top, the upper shell of the rod bearings, because they're always under load there. Two cycle engine, they got compression and power, compression and power. I feel like it's ready to fall right out. There it goes. Oh, caught it. All right. I got the thrust bearings in there, too. There's the thrusts. All righty. Got a nice wear ring there. Or what do we got there? So it's, it feels a bit high in the center. What's the crank look like? Let's zoom in on that. We got some oily stuff there. Yeah, the crank's got some wear on it for sure. I can feel it. Oh yeah, right there. There's quite a step there. Whew. Yeah, see that? Catching my fingernail on it. Wow. Well, that's quite a step. Okay. All right. Well, swing that back over. Let's zoom you back out and take this rod cap off. Definitely has some hours on it. We didn't even look at the hour meter yet. The hour meter doesn't show all that many hours, so who knows? Maybe it doesn't work. Eh. Hey, not great, not horrible. Of course, all the wear is going to be up on the other end. The other shell. So I'm going to rotate the crankshaft. We'll try 90 degrees. And, uh, yeah, rotate the crank 90 degrees, then rotate it back down. That should shove the piston up. And, uh, we'll swing the crank back down so we can see that, that upper shell. Let's see, can I sit you down here while I do that or no? Well, looks like I might be able to just stand you right up there. Look at that. Well, a big drop of oil probably going to drop right on my lens. All right, hang on. Okay, now we're going to come back. And what did that do for us? Anything? Not really. Might be able to, oh, well, there's the shell. <laughs> Alright, got the shell out. That's good. 
I think I had some cardboard down. Hmm. Yeah. Look like a little bit of base metal showing there in the center. We'll clean these up inside. Look at these bearings. I've uh, given them a little clean. And they are pretty rough. It's not wear from high hours, it's oil contamination. You can see the scratches. Just oil contamination with dirt and grit. I mean, I mean, I could, I can feel the step there. Well, you know what do you expect? It, it's not a flu, up uh, uh, flu, full flow oiling system. And based on what that crank looked like, I mean, the crank needs to be cut undersized for sure to, to really do a good job on this. It looks like somebody may have just put in new bearings without doing the crank last time, without actually taking the crank out and grinding it. Uh, that's why we see that line right in the center there. All right, well, they're going to go back in. I'm, we're not rebuilding this engine. We're just going to try to get it running. So let's take a look at the uh, injectors here. Uh, number one's tip looks okay. I cleaned up. Here, let's see if I can focus that. All the racks move freely, by the way, very freely. A couple of the plungers are sticky though, so I'm going to have to fill these up with a uh, PB blaster or something to uh, get them freed up. They're not all. Uh, in kind of shape that number one was in. Let's see, number two, not too bad, but there's pitting. One of them's actually pretty bad. Oh yeah, there we go, here's number three. Look at that pitting right there in the tip. I mean, all these tips are pretty much shot. This one's just bad. It will run though, I think. And four. See the pitting on there? Pretty rough. All right, well, I'm going to fill these up, let them soak. See if we can get these plungers. They're not stuck, but they are sticky. Like that one, you can hear it. All righty, and then uh, in the meantime, I'm going to put these bearings back together and make an oil pan gasket. Injectors have been sitting for a while now, number of hours, with uh, PB Blaster in them. The racks, they, they still move freely. But the plungers are what's uh, more uh, important in this case. So we got nice, smooth plunger travel out of each of them. No more binding like before. So this is the no fuel position. The racks are fully extended. That's why I can depress the, pl the plungers all the way. Now if I go to the full fuel position, you'll see the plungers will come to a stop. That's because the, uh, the chambers, the barrels inside there are full of PB blaster. And I am trying to push that through the delivery valve, for lack of a better term, I don't know what it's actually termed, the delivery valve. I have to overcome the, the spring pressure in the delivery valve to actually get them to shoot fuel. So what I'm going to do is bring all the racks to no fuel, and we're going to take a soft face hammer and bump each one of these injectors and see that we get a halfway decent spray pattern. Let's see, let me set you up here and zoom in on those nozzles. There we go. Okay. 
So we're in the no fuel position. I'm going to bump each one, make sure we get no fuel spray. Nothing, right? Now we're going to go to full fuel. For some reason, I'm not seeing any fuel shooting out this direction of this nozzle. Nah, definitely got a plugged hole here. Hmm. Let's take a look at the tip of that one. I mean, there's not really much we're going to be able to see there. The holes are so tiny. I'll try that one a couple more times. And uh, if not, well, we'll just put it back in as is. Well, I was not able to get Injector 3 to spray any better. Still uh, got a couple plugged holes. But, hey, we're not putting new tips on these. So it's just going to be what it is. Maybe it'll uh, clear those holes out once we get some heat in the engine. I kind of doubt it though. I had the uh, bore scope out to take a peek down the uh, cylinders and they're about what we would expect uh, for this engine based on what we've seen so far. Uh, we've got some vertical scratches and some evidence of water intrusion. You can see that typical rust staining on uh, the cylinder walls in some areas. So, not expecting a whole lot out of this thing, but uh, I still think it'll run. I'm going to go ahead and install the injectors and the uh, rocker, rocker shafts, get all that torqued down. We'll come back when we're ready to adjust everything. So now we're ready to start the overhead adjustment on this engine. Uh, that includes uh, valve lash, uh, injector timing, and uh, setting of the injector control rack. So before we do that, I'd like to thank one of the uh, one of the subscribers to my channel, Mike Mayer. Very graciously gave me this set of 71 series uh, manuals. These are Detroit manuals for the inline 71. And he also gave me a uh, complete tune-up set for the uh, Detroit engines. So thanks a lot, Mike. I will get a lot of use out of this stuff over the next few years. Next many years, I hope. All right, so I did number one's valves off camera just to get a feel for uh, how they set. So let's rotate the engine again. Make sure I'm going the right way. Let's see what, what the next injector is. Looks like it's going to be number three. Alright, all the way bottomed out.
Yeah, I got one tight one and one loose one. Let's start with the loose one. This would be about impossible without this little uh, tool here. Just a 5 16 wrench on a handle with a nice tight bend there. Really difficult to do without that. Wrong way. I think that's the wrong way. Yep. Okay. So it's tight there. I'm going to back it off. Still, oh, there we go. A little bit of drag. I find that when, when you snug the lock nut up, it actually puts quite a bit more drag on the uh, gauge. So I'm going to set it to where it's just barely touching. And then we'll snug the lock nut. Yeah, see that tightened up a bit there. Let me slack it back off a little bit. There we go. And give it a final tightening. There we go, just the right amount of drag. Okay, this one, that's that's really tight. Alright, let's back back the adjustment off. It's actually the push rod that I'm turning here. Even with the tool, sometimes it's hard to get it in there. Going the wrong way, Mike. Going the wrong way. There we go. All right, so we're loose. Just starting to drag there. Okay. Let's trade hands and tighten the lock nut. Nope, tightened up pretty good on me there. Let's see how tight did I get it? Not that tight. All right, just starting to drag. All right, just the right bit of drag. Okay, kind of a fiddly operation. So now that the valves are adjusted, we got to do the injector height or injector timing adjustment. So the four, the uh, 71 series calls for well, 71 series with this injector calls for this timing tool 1.460. Uh, so there is a hole drilled in the injector body that this small diameter here fits into, and the idea is that you drop the pin in that hole and you rotate the little flag here, the little wide part, and you have to adjust the height of this plunger to where the, uh, this wide area just clears it when you rotate it. So I've got to bring, the, what, I've already done the other ones, this is not cylinder two, so I'm going to crank the engine over until the exhaust valves are fully open, and that's the point where we adjust the injector. I'm going to set that in there and rotate the engine. Okay. The other ones were pretty much adjusted where they need to be. This one is not. So you can see when I drop this pin in and it bottoms out on the injector body, 
I cannot rotate the uh, wide area over the injector follower or injector tappet. So I've got to adjust that. Same thing, the uh, push rod is threaded and you rotate that to get the adjustment. Wrong way. Wrong way again. Come on. Okay, now I got clearance. Just barely. It's still scraping along. I can see this requires quite a bit of experience and feel to get the uh, get this down pat because the tool is a loose fit in that hole in the injector body. So if you rotate it and rock it toward the plunger or away from the plunger, that's going to change the height slightly. So I'm just going to try to keep it vertical and as parallel with the spring as, as I can just by eye. And I rotate it, I got plenty of clearance. So I'm going to back the adjustment off until I can feel it hit. Or rub, I should say, because I don't want it to actually stop. And we're actually we're right about there. See, I can feel it drag there if I rock it toward the plunger. Away from the plunger and I rotate it, it's free. Just kind of got to keep that little medium there right in the center. And it feels like we're clear. I can just feel a contact. Let me snug the lock nut up here. You can see it kind of wiping away the oil there. Just barely contacting. We're going to call that good. Snug that down all the way. Make sure it doesn't move. Yep, I like it. Okay, well, that was fun. Alright, so we're going to do a little abbreviated uh, injector control tube adjustment. Uh, I think they call this the control tube or the control rack and then there's the individual injector racks. Each injector rack has one of these adjustable clamps right with the with a lever with a little ball on the end of it that sits in this little C shaped area here. So what we need to adjust when the it is when the tube is in the full fuel position we need to make sure that each injector's rack is also in the full fuel position just so that the injectors and the cylinders share the load evenly. So I'm going to zoom in on number four here since that's the only one that I have not adjusted. And what I'm adjusting is the, are those two flathead screws. Zoom on in here. Okay. So that's no fuel. This is the full fuel position and the, the book specifies that you can take a screwdriver and push down on this C-shaped area right here and it should spring back up, which it's not really doing that. It's almost tight but not quite. So pretty much you'll want the ball of this lever lightly pressing up against the inside surface here or the surface nearest the rack of the adjustment or not of the adjustment but of this little c-shaped area so in order to do that i'm gonna just adjust these screws ever so slightly this screw here when you tighten this one it brings the tip of the lever closer to the injector body I'm going to back, the, uh, back this one out just a little bit first. And 
And that was almost perfect. It only takes a tiny bit. Can you see what it's doing now? So when I press down on that, it needs to spring back up. Now I need to make sure that 3, 2, and 1 are the same, because I've already gone through and adjusted those. Now actually number 3 is loose, number 2 is loose, and number 1 is loose. So that means I've over tightened number 4. So let me back out on that here. Still have the movement there, but do I have it on 3? Nope, still loose. Quite a fiddly operation. Okay, got it on four. Now got it on three. How about two? Got it on two. How about one? Well, one's a little bit loose yet. Nope, they feel good now. Alrighty. Snug them up a little bit. Check it again. Could be a little bit tighter. Like I said, quite a fiddly operation here. A little bit more. You can't tighten these down too much or else you'll damage the tube here. All right, we're good there. All right, I'm gonna reconnect the governor rod and we're gonna and we are ready to put some oil in this thing hook the fuel up and try to start it I'm gonna pull this manifold off as well the exhaust that way we can uh, we can see how each cylinder is firing alright well the time is finally here let's see if this thing will run I know you're all saying geez it's about time alright well I got a nice hot battery hooked up some new cables and we're gonna crank it over make sure we got oil pressure. I have the uh, stop lever tied over and we're at no fuel and I got a vice grip on here. The classic, the obligatory vice grip on the throttle uh, shaft there and we got a block of wood to cover the intake if we need to. But it does have the air damper which I can trip um, if we uh, run into a problem and a fire extinguisher is nearby. CO2 to snuff it out. So, all right. Oh, let's look at the uh, exhaust ports. I pulled that manifold off. There was a mouse nest in it. Should have expected that. I had to chip uh, some carbon out of here to free them up a little bit. Look at that. Look at how coked up this thing is. This cylinder's pretty well clear. I also shot some PB blaster down there just to lube the valve stems up. I mean, look at that. That's almost completely choked down. It's like a little cavern. Well, let's see. I have cranked it over already. It turns over really quick. Doesn't have much compression at all. Let's uh, let's see if we build oil pressure. Looks like they had the Murphy switch set at uh, about well, 15, 20 pounds. All right, let's crank it. Yeah, about 30 pounds. We got 15 W40 in here. Now, now, don't get all, don't get all worked up. 
It's low ash 1540. <laughs> Not that that's going to matter on something as worn out as this, right? Alrighty, well, let's try to crank it over. I'm going to crank it over, no fuel, for a minute, and then push the rack open and see what happens. All right. It's pretty warm out now. It's got to be almost 50 degrees. Okay. Quite a smoke show, huh? No fire. A little heat down the intake might uh, might let it kick off. Maybe I'll uh, I'll give it a shot of PB blaster down the intake. Maybe that'll help it seal a little bit. I don't want to throw too much down there. Let's see what that does. Probably nothing. That seems to be building a little bit of compression the more I turn it. All right, let me go get a propane torch, and uh, we'll uh, put a little bit of heat down there. All right, well, I'm going to try to work the propane torch in the intake with the starter button at the same time, and uh, work the throttle with my other hand. Let's see what we got. A little awkward, huh? Oh, that was something. Maybe a little bit of heat's all it needs. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> you know, it's probably a good thing it's, there's a little bit of wind out. It's dispersing that smoke pretty quick. Oh man, it wants to go so bad. Nope, oh, my torch went out. You know, I should have hooked up a fuel pressure gauge. And the wind is really messing with this torch.
<laughs> that was pretty good, huh? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't think it was going to go. <laughs> Whew. You know, I know we completely glossed over the cooling system on this thing. There was, there was a little bit of antifreeze in it. I just topped the rest off with water. Not really a problem for these short runs. Old General Motors. Hmm. All right, well, I'll try to start it up again. There's not really much, I guess I could rig the throttle up somehow, but there's no throttle lock anymore. So, it's just going to return back to idle. I don't know what the idle's set at. Let's see if, it'll, if it will idle. I'm going to disconnect this spring that's pulling the throttle to no fuel. I'll leave the vice grips on. We'll hook this spring back up, and we'll allow the uh, the hand throttle to operate. Let's see what that does. That's if we can get it to restart. It's probably going to need heat again. I mean, it's really low on compression, obviously, the way them cylinders are smoking. I'm going to disconnect this spring. I'll disconnect it here. Okay. So now it should come to some kind of idle. Take this wire off. You know, I didn't check any of the adjustments in the governor. We kind of glossed over that. Let's see if it'll restart with no heat. I'm going to keep my hand right on the uh, th uh, vice grips here. Now, it's not going to idle without some kind of uh, something hooked up to the throttle. I could probably bump the idle screw up a little bit, but 
that'll come at a different time. I'm surprised it restarted with no heat. Let's try it again. Let's see, that's uh, no fuel. All right, I think that's enough with no uh, with no exhaust on it. <laughs> we do have some neighbors over there, and it is Sunday afternoon. So we had about 40 pounds of oil pressure at moderate throttle. Of course, the oil is still dead cold. We didn't really put any heat into it yet. Just a tiny bit of heat, nothing really. Whew. Well, it's not completely dead after all, is it? I mean, it needs completely rebuilt. Who are you kidding? <laughs> uh, that was fun, right? You had fun? I had fun. I think that's about it for this video. We're going to try one of these. Hold it in your hand and film yourself. How's that going? Yeah. I think somebody once said this is the most American engine ever built. All right, well, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. We'll get back to more serious things. The, uh, the Chrysler there next week or the week after. My parts did come in. So I'll see you on the next one.